Hey everyone, hey. welcome back to another episode. So I am here today with Cami Bellis. She is the co-director in the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. She is also the founder of Mothers, Parents in Transition, a national organization dedicated to supporting parents of transgender and gender expansive children in custody disputes with unsupportive ex-partners through collaborative research, education, and advocacy. Mothers and Parents in Transition envisions family court outcomes that affirm transgender and gender expansive youth and their supportive parents. Cami is also the recent recipient of the 2020 Building the Next Generation of Academic Physicians, LGBT Health Professional Leadership Award. So last summer I took a webinar with Cami and was just blown away by all of the issues uh, surrounding this topic. It's so important. And I really just wanted to spend an episode talking about it and highlighting the unique challenges that come with that. So welcome Cami. Thanks Renee, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. It's a long time coming to get you on here, but I am really, I'm really pumped for this because this is such an important conversation. And I think that the, anyone who's going through it feels so alone. So we're gonna break it all apart, try to offer some support and then send them to some resources that they can turn to after they listen to this um, to get in contact with you. So it's, in, in the plainest terms, you work with parents usually the moms who have a child who is transgender or gender expansive, and they have another parent that does not support that, right? Is that like the plainest way of saying it? In a nutshell, yes. Okay. Uh, so yep, we have parents around the country, like you said, particularly mothers. Um, all of our case law, all of our research uh, really surrounds uh, particularly the mothers or those assigned female at birth, um, who are the ones who uh, the child initially expresses gender nonconformity or what we call gender creativity uh, to that parent. And, and then the parent then affirms that child in their home. And, and the other parent, um, generally the father, but it, um, not necessarily. We, we have had some parents who were in a same gender relationship. And so it really just depends too. Uh, there's lots of factors at play, but um, generally that other parent it is not supportive for a variety of reasons. Um, and then seeks to um, challenge some of the things that the supportive parent is doing and tries to block the child from socially transitioning, medically transitioning, legally transitioning. Um, and so, you know, it ends up in, in family court. And this is certainly a, a very niche area. Um, you know, you'd said, you know, just starting to talk about it. Uh, you know, we've been talking about this since uh, about 2012. And we're, it's really just starting to uh, explode. Um, you know, there are some, some cases that have been highlighted that, that get a little bit of a media, uh, you know, in the last few years. And that can sometimes um, really ramp up the, the national conversation about it. Um, and then we also had uh, myself and, and a colleague who was our principal investigator, um, we had a paper published in Family Court Review in 2019. And that also really started to spur the conversation on what are the issues that these supportive parents and their transgender or gender expansive children face in the family court system, a system that is rife with institutional transphobia, with implicit bias, and really haven't been formally trained on the issues that these children face. What do you see courts are doing? Like, what are some of the big decisions that have come out that have been successful or um, have been unsuccessful, really? Yeah, and I, I assume you mean by successful that the child is able to be authentically themselves and that we have court orders that are in the best interest of trans children. And so really the court... Uh, court cases really vary and it really varies on how they're handled but more often than not uh, the courts are un uneducated about these issues and we know that in implicit bias and transphobia really run the show um, we're slowly seeing some court professionals that are trained on these issues but that's still really rare um, with many of the cases that we've seen um, judges are, are signing court orders uh, like they're gender police which means you know they'll have a court order um, 
um, generally because the, the rejecting or unsupportive parent um, asks the courts to forbid the mother from um, affirming the child. And so a court order might look like a judge signing off on, you know, parent has to remove all feminine clothes from the house. And, and we, you know, this is for cases where there is an assigned male child at birth. And so mom is, is court ordered to remove feminine clothes, um, remove anything that quote unquote appears feminine and really like who decides that? That's a little bit arbitrary and based off of a, our stereotypical notions and assumptions of gender. Um, and so these are removed and because they're deemed appropriate, inappropriate, um, we know that courts are much more likely to have court orders that reinforce these harmful gender stereotypes and roles. Um, particularly for those that are assigned male at birth, it's not the same in reverse, uh, meaning, you know, if we have those children who are assigned female at birth, um, oftentimes those of us who are assigned female at birth, we are able to um, be a little bit more fluid in our gender expression. Uh, and for the courts, that's just kind of seen for some of them as like, oh, we just have a, like a tomboy or you know, there's not generally court orders that go in the opposite, if that makes any sense. So like, what are we going to like take away the child's genes and, and their, you know, their Star Wars posters? I mean, no, that that's preposterous. Uh, so what we have here is really gender policing um, for a lot of these uh, children that are assigned male at birth. And so we certainly see a, a gender discrepancy there. Um, so that's, those are some of the, you know, some of the things that we see. We see harmful court orders. We see uh, family court professionals, particularly uh, uh, parenting coordinators, guardian ad litems. Uh, therapeutic interventionists and really attorneys too that are overstepping their their boundaries, um, the the ethical guidelines that they have, and they're you know kind of it, it's almost like the child's gender identity is open to discussion and open to interpretation, um, meaning like how trans is the child or how can we you know limit the um, how affirming the, the mother can be. And, and, and in 100% of these cases, the mother is blamed for quote unquote, making the child transgender. And so in every single case that we've worked with and every single case that I've seen, any parent that has contacted me, uh, they, they have all been blamed. And again, it's particularly the mother, um, which is really kind of an old trope uh, that we've seen throughout many years. And I'm sure um, a lot of your audience can probably relate that um, there is more um, policing of the mother, uh, things that we do, right? Like over parenting or, oh, we were too, um, we babied our, you know, male children too much. And so, you know, they, that's probably the reason why they have, you know, the gender non-conforming behavior. And, and that's just not true. That's, it's, it's a, a very common and harmful myth that continues to be perpetuated throughout the family court system. And so, um, you know, that's certainly one of the biggest barriers is trying to, uh, get family court professionals to realize, um, we need to look at the experts. We need to look to the medical and mental health providers, expert recommendations and guidelines that we have for this. And, and thankfully we have that, but um, it, all too often, it seems like uh, family court professionals are making these decisions uh, without uh, looking at the experts, without looking at the guidance and recommendations that we have from the research that says that um, children need to be validated and affirmed in their gender identities, and if that means that they have a medical intervention, that that needs to be supported. So there's so much what you of what you just said that I want to unpack, and I'm not even yeah. sure where to start, but I'm going to start just by the courts because I'm certified as a guardian ad litem, and I can tell you in that certification, this issue never came up, and so it, it's and, and then we put in a role to maybe have to assess something like this or deal with something like this. And we don't have the tools and we haven't had the training to, in order to do that. So clearly my position on it came out when I determined what a successful court case is, but I'm sure that there's a lot of guardian ad litems out there who feel differently. And that what I would consider a success is, is a failure to them in, in their eyes based on what right. their position is. 
What type of training are you seeing in other states? Like who's getting it right right now? And Connecticut is re a really progressive state. And I think it's, it, it's a not, like I haven't heard of any of these issues coming up. I haven't seen trainings like this for professionals, um, which is really a shame. So what states yeah. are doing it right? Yeah. And, you know, Renee, I'm not surprised to hear that, you know, you weren't formally trained on this issue. You know, the vast majority of court professionals are not. Uh, I have heard of some good training out of California. Um, I have, uh, you know, a, some colleagues in Southern Arizona. Um, and so there's um, a few folks from the National Center for Lesbian Rights. There's some family law attorneys and there's some experts that study trans youth um, who have started to create these trainings and offer them, you know, to family court professionals, to judges and saying, look, here are the issues that these children and their families face. Here are the medical recommendations. And, you know, this is what we're saying is in the best interest of trans children, because, you know, we don't necessarily have very clear guidelines as in legally of what are the best interests of a trans child. And so we it's important for us to look at those medical and mental health experts who've been doing this work, um, you know, to, to let us know, you know, what, how do we proceed? You know, how do you proceed as, as a family court professional when you have a trans child um, with, in a custody case? And um, yeah, it's, it's not surprising. Um, so I, I, I can't speak for other states. I just know uh, those are the few that I am aware of, but uh, I guess the vast majority either don't have, they probably don't have anything, or they might have um, maybe very general kind of um, LGBTQ children's like issues, maybe in like, um, whether it's like, um, you know, children's welfare or um, foster care system, yeah. like how to navigate that. But I haven't seen too many that are formalized uh, related to how do you handle when you have a trans child in a family court case. Uh, it's it, there's so much work to be done. So let's talk about that because you are you're in the trenches. You are doing that work through your program, mothers, parents in transition. So what type of what is it is it education is it advocacy is it can someone come to you for help on how to navigate the court system yeah so really one of the biggest uh things that i do is provide support and that's moral support that can look like strategizing or coming up with like a legal strategy with the parent we also connect the parents nationwide uh so you know there are groups that are kind of formed around the country of, of particular parent groups and we, we can connect them and and really like you said that can be something that you feel really isolated that you're the only person that's going through this and years ago that's really how the parents felt there was no one else uh, there was no one doing this research there was no one look, looking at this and very few organizations would actually uh, advocate and uh, take over these cases and so that's really one of one of the biggest barriers too is trying to connect organizations to these parents is another thing that we do to help them. So whether that's connecting the parents to the National Center for Lesbian Rights or to certain attorneys that can help them, attorneys that are, you know, at least aware of these issues or say that they have some understanding of LGBTQ issues, um, to uh, connecting them to uh, organizations like Gender Spectrum, uh, Transactive in Oregon. So there are a few of these organizations around the country that can help. But when parents have uh, historically reached out to these kind of larger organizations that are like fight for LGBTQ rights, they won't touch family law. And you can practice understand why. Uh, well, because it, it's not it's not at the appeals appellate level. It's not generally case law. And so and it costs a lot of money. And you have to also, you know, be in that particular state or district um, to uh, to be an attorney for for that parent. And so it, you know, one of the hopes is that we can create this uh, list of affirming attorneys that parents can call on. And so that's that's one of the things that we do. 
Um, I would say the other arm of our organization is research. And so, you know, connecting with my, my colleague, Kate Kubalanka, who is at Miami University in Ohio, you know, she was really the first one to look at these parents. Uh, and that's where our, our study came from, where we looked at 10 uh, parents, all mothers, uh, who affirm their, their children in a, in a variety of family court uh, custody kind of um, situations. And what were the barriers that they faced? And so um, certainly research is one of the arms of the organization. Um, if anyone ever wants to partner, I'm, I'm happy to partner with them. Uh, we have a, a toolkit that's coming out uh, next month, and, and that's for medical and mental health providers. And so one of the big things in these cases is that we look to experts in the field, expert witnesses to um, come and say, you know, what is their expert opinion? What are their recommendations? And we hope that the family court professionals and the judges listen to them. But a lot of these medical and mental health providers are not trained, right? Like, how are you going to testify? What does it mean when you have, you know, parent A saying this, parent B saying this, who do you listen to? Well, I mean, that's a trick question. You listen to the child. Uh, but how do you strategically um, go about kind of, uh, let me back up. As a medical and mental health provider, when you have a parent or two parents who are in disagreement over a child's gender identity, um, you know, and you're called to testify or you're called to, um, you know, share your, your medical recommendations or opinions on the case, it's really helpful for that person to know, you know, how do we counteract these harmful myths and stereotypes about trans children? How do you explain the myth that the, the mother's making the child trans um, in a way that the family court uh, professionals and, and judges are going to understand? And that, right, we, we look to the medical recommendations, we look to you know, the, um, you know, the American Psychological Association, we look to the American Academy of Pediatrics, they have very clear guidelines on the best interest uh, is supporting a child, supporting the child's uh, gender, however they identify. And so, um, you know, that, that type of advocacy is, is really important. That toolkit is really important. Um, nothing like that exists yet. So that would be another thing that we focus on. And then just advocacy, doing things like this, uh, you know, doing webinars, reaching out, getting as many people uh, talking about this issue as possible. So you said something that the children's opinion is the opinion is the one that matters. But if that was the case, we wouldn't be having this conversation because these <laughs> custody cases would go down based on what the kids are asking for or what they're, you know, what they're turning to their parents for support in. Mm -hmm. So do you have any, um, any theories on why that's not happening? And what are the reasonings that you're seeing that the, the child's wishes are being disregarded in these situations? Well, I would say it comes down to a few reasons. The first is institutional transphobia. And that the way that that looks in family court is that we do not take a, really a person, uh, a trans person or a child's um, right to their own body, um, having bodily autonomy, having the right to say, this is who I am, and that that's not, it, that's not open for negotiation, um, that we seek to challenge and question even the existence of trans people and trans people's lived experiences is transphobia. And so that gets perpetuated throughout the family court system. Um, so I would say that's the first thing, the biggest one. The second is children's rights. Uh, children don't have too many rights in the United States. Parents' rights trump. And um, while that can make sense for a lot of things, um, someone's internal sense of their gender identity uh, is not really open for discussion. And um, that is my own personal opinion. That's my expert opinion. And, and that's probably the, the opinion of, of many of the researchers and, and experts that I've worked with. 
Um, and so when you have this kind of combination of institutional transphobia, we have a lack of children's rights in the United States in general, and that the younger the child is, we see more of this like, um, well, let's get the child assessed in terms of their gender um, or in, and put them through all of these gender assessments that they don't necessarily need or, or that we don't really believe them because, you know, this myth that, oh, they just need to get older and then they can do, they'll know their, their gender a little bit more. And that is transphobia because we don't ask that of cisgender children, right? Like we don't, we don't go around asking cisgender children, are you sure you know your gender? Right, like I don't, I don't know about you, but I was never asked, you know, growing up, like, are you sure you're a girl or are you sure you want to be on the cheerleading squad? Right. So this again, right, like rooted in transphobia, in that um, the younger the children, we believe that um, they're more open to interpretation, and let's let's have more discussion on that. And this, the, that's the whole thing. The child's too young to know their gender. And that, that's really kind of across the board. That's, that's a lot of what we see. And so unfortunately, and in the quote unquote success stories that we see, that is one, that is one caveat is that the child or children are gen, generally older, right? So they're in adolescence. They're probably between, I would say after the age of 12 or 13, um, the courts are more likely to listen to them. And that's, that's horrible, but that's kind of where we are right now is that uh, they tend to listen to them more, um, though the children at those ages, right? They're hitting puberty. And so puberty is knocking on their door and they're like, I, this is uncomfortable. I, I don't feel comfortable going to school. There can be increased risk of suicide. suicide. There's depression, there's anxiety. Um, and then there's like being a middle schooler and a high schooler in general, which just exacerbates everything. But when you have um, where you can't be your authentic self, you can't have a medical transition, uh, you, can't, you can't legally change your name, um, the courts will sometimes listen to those, to those teens who are a little bit older. And so um, unfortunately, that's where we're at right now. I, um, like I said, for the ones that are successful, it has been generally that, um, you know, the, the parent who is not necessarily supportive, like grudgingly agrees to maybe the child being on puberty blockers or um, being on cross-sex hormones or legally changing their name. So I don't know if that answered your original question. <laughs> It, it does. And I'm, I'm just like this topic. This is the, the reason why almost a year ago, I was like, oh, I have to have a, a deeper conversation with her because there's just so much here to, to talk about. Um, what happens? Do you even know? Have you been doing this long enough to see what happens when a child is not affirmed, when the court says to remove all of the girl stuff, if it's a, a, a biological a born a, a male? Um, what it, and they're forced to not be the person who they know that they are. Like, what what happens out the other end? Like, what happens to that parent, that parental relationship with the parent who's not affirming? Have you seen any of that? So I can say anecdotally what has happened. We have not followed these children uh, long enough. Um, we actually do have research, not necessarily with, with kids that are, whose parents are engaged in custody disputes, but we have research on, you know, just uh, typical trans kids who are not in custody disputes where if they are not affirmed, if they don't have supportive parents, you know, we know they're more likely to engage in, you know, in risky behavior, um, have an increase in substance use disorder, increase in anxiety, depression, um, uh, suicidal ideation, um, issues at school, um, lower educational aspirations. And so we know that there's all these kind of awful things that happen um, when a child or when a trans person is not able to live authentically as themselves. And so um, we, we posit that the same thing probably holds true, if not worse, uh, with these um, children who, uh, you know, whose parents are in disagreement. And so um, you know, we've had children who 
um, right? They, they act out, they get really angry. They refuse to leave the house. Um, their, you know, their depression and anxiety skyrockets, uh, they will harm themselves. Um, and then, you know, and, and that can be a variety of things, right? Um, you know, that can be, you know, I've, I've had parents contact me because their kid is, you know, slamming their head uh, against the wall um, because mom took all of their girl things away and they're angry. And um, sometimes it doesn't necessarily matter whether the mom, you know, says, I need help. Um, you took away this court, you know, you put this court order in place, my child is harming themselves. Um, I, I need support here. And um, unfortunately, the courts really won't do much about that. Um, they might say, well, it's because of the the conflict between the parents. That's why the child is um, self-harming. That's why the child's upset. And they don't want to point to that the child has now been forced to be their assigned gender. Uh, they don't want to look at that because to them, it's much easier to point to, oh, parent conflict or both parents are in conflict. No, that's not, that's not the reason. The reason is transphobia. The reason is harmful court orders. I'm really curious to know if judges are trained when they go, most judges go to training once a year, they learn how, it's like judge school, at least in Connecticut, you know, they have for a couple of weeks. And I'm really curious for the family judges, if this is any part of their curriculum on this topic. Um, I, I bet, I bet it's not. Yeah. And, you know, and I, like I said, I, I don't know what other states are doing. That would actually be a really interesting uh, study or report that we could do of looking at all of the training that, that family court judges are mandated to take. And is there anything related to uh, LGBTQ youth? I, I'm not sure. I honestly yeah. don't have an answer. I, I, and unless you're a judge, you probably don't know. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like a secret club, you know, you know, what happens in fight club stays in fight club. Yeah. Like we're not going to know how they're trained. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I can say I, I have not based off of, um, you know, the, the, the parents that I help and, you know, the cases that we've heard about case law that we can look at, it doesn't appear that there ha they have been formally trained on trans issues, um, gender affirming care, um, medically accurate information, um, or their own implicit biases around trans people or gender. Um, so I would say it, it doesn't appear that they've been formally trained. You know, I worked with a mom a few years ago and a, a judge, this was in the South, and the judge actually said in court, a lesbian mom and a transgender child, there's something wrong with this picture. Oh my God. And so, it, you know, people will sometimes say to me, well, you know, it's 2021, like, it, you know, things have changed. It can't be that bad. And I say, well, it is, uh, you know, and if you think that you're not living in reality, you are not aware of the issues that are, that these parents and their children face. And, you know, it's kind of like living in this like fantasy land that, that a judge wouldn't say that or a judge doesn't have bias. And um, I think that that's one of the clearest examples of uh, a bias coming in. And I, you know, and that case really exemplifies when you have kind of these multiple oppressions where we have a, a mom who's a lesbian and who just happens to have a trans child. And so she, she's got, you know, two strikes against her. Yeah. Oh, that, that just like that, that's so heartbreaking. That really just, just ticked me off and made me so sad for, for the whole situation. We just, we have to do better. Our court system has to do better. Our judges need to do better. We need to be trained better. Like the, the whole thing is just, it breaks my heart. Kimmy, how did you get involved in this? Because you are so passionate about it and you are, you're like a visionary in this field. And I know there's, there's others that are with you. Um, but it's such a unique area. And I think it, it, you are such a light for some, for mothers or parents who are going through this. So what's your story? So I, I mean, I've been doing LGBTQ work since 2005 and, you know, I realized I didn't know a whole heck of a lot about the T, right? Uh, trans issues. And so 
I am mostly uh, self-educated. I did kind of throw myself into this work and go to conferences and um, really a lot of, of, of my grad work, uh, my grad school work came from how do we teach people about these challenging concepts like racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia. And so, um, you know, I got really involved with the trans community and just teaching about trans issues and then really found this, this um, group of, of parents who it was like this, um, this area that wasn't even explored yet, which seemed like, uh, you know, the most at risk and needing of support. And so um, that's when I contacted uh, Kate Kuvalanka in, in Ohio and I said, hey, you know, can you research these parents because no one is and, and she said yes and it took us seven years to get that published and get that study going and it's a longitudinal study so um you know i i've i've been in this work for quite some time and particularly uh trans youth and adults since 2012 uh and you know i guess as far as my passion i you know i i almost have a sense that uh i was put on this earth to do this work yeah i agree i, agree. I think you're you're an angel how do people connect with you, find you, um, those who are listening who say that they need that extra support, where do they go? Yeah, so um, you can certainly reach out to me. Uh, you know, I, um, I, I, I know you're going to share my email with folks. And I would certainly say um, if I can just kind of um, pivot a little bit to what can parents actually do when they Absolutely. find in these in these situations um financial is the biggest barrier uh, other other than institutional transphobia that these parents face if someone has the financial means to get an attorney who understands these issues that i would say is one of the biggest things um, you can contact me um, we can put you in touch with um, other organizations that support parents uh like i i had mentioned um NCLR and TransActive, um, sometimes we can put our heads together and come up with some legal strategy. Uh, I would also advise parents to document everything, which is probably something that you uh, recommend anyways uh, to parents, regardless of um, kind of what situation they're in. But um, that is really critical in these cases because like I said, when we are, uh, when the family courts are blaming uh, particularly one parent, um, or they say, well, you made a unilateral decision, or you went behind the other parents back and supported the child. And so you want to document everything. Um, we want to follow the recommendations of the medical and mental health experts in the field. And so at least, you know, when we have parents who are saying, I was following recommendations, I'm following what, what, the, what are the recommendations from the experts. It's a little bit harder to challenge that. It's certainly challenged in court, but it's a little, it's a little bit harder to challenge that. Um, if you have joint legal decision-making, uh, this is a little bit tricky, but attempting to communicate things with your ex as much as possible. This can get tricky when you have an unsupportive parent. Um, like I said, they they might think that the child's gender identity is, is open for discussion. Um, what, what is open for discussion is how we as parents plan to move forward and support our child and follow the recommendations from the experts. And that is something that I really encourage the parents to do is that um, things that you do need to share legally, uh, we need to share those things, but we are not legally obligated to share our child's identity, mm -hmm. parent, right? Like if a child came to us and, and, you know, they came out as gay or, um, you know, they, and I'm trying to think of another identity, um, but certainly uh, I've never seen a court, I've never seen a, 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 uh, a parent's agreement uh, yeah. that states that you need to, whenever a child wants to, or, or is, is, a, is coming out, or I guess is a sexual orientation other than straight, you need to alert the other parent. No, we don't have court, we don't have parent agreements like that. Um, so why would we, you know, out the child and, and 
in doing that. And particularly in these, in these cases, sometimes the child says, I don't want the other parent to know yet. I, I just, I'm just letting you know. And then maybe when I feel comfortable, I'll let, you know, I'll let dad or mom know. And so that is not our, that is not our right to out the child to their other parent without their consent. Uh, and I will, I will fight that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that that's a really good point because most, a lot of times that I've seen anyway, I've seen it, it's in, like in my own personal family too. Um, when that person came out, it was, okay, I'm coming out to the person I'm comfortable with and not yeah. the other parent until, you know, until they were ready. And yeah. so I think that that's important because I think that that probably happens a lot because there is typically, even in an intact family, sometimes you have one parent who the child just knows is going to be supportive and the other parent, yeah. you know, yeah. so. And that's tricky. And I'm sure a lot of legal people, particularly attorneys might disagree with me and that's fine. Um, I come from a children's rights perspective and a social justice perspective. That's my background. So I, that's the reason why I probably have the perspective that I do is that, um, you know, our, our job is to support the child. And if they say, I'm just not ready to tell my other parent, that is our job as a parent to respect that. Yeah. We can yeah. encourage them, right? Like we can, and I've known parents who just encourage the heck out of their children. Like, yeah. are you, are you sure you don't want to tell, you know, mom or dad, are you, are you, you know, when, when would you feel comfortable? Would you like me to help you tell them? And it becomes this, like, um, trying to encourage the child to do that. And they're, you know, they might just not be ready yet. And so, um, that's kind of where the taking the child's lead is, is really important on that. I can, I can almost like see it now, the other lawyer who's arguing that that information should have been shared, that, yes. you know, it's joint legal custody, that's health, religion, education, major decisions. Yes. And that could, you know, you can interpret that to fall under one of those, <laughs> you know, and you can, like, I can hear the argument that the lawyer would be making, which goes yeah. right to your point about education. And these people who are making decisions, these experts, these judges, these guardian ad litems need to be educated and they need yeah. the training because it's such a disservice when we're, we're having people make major decisions or recommendations, guardians making recommendations, and they don't really understand the, the, yeah. what, what's happening behind the scenes. And they're doing, yeah. they're making this all based on their own biases and their own personal beliefs um, yes. about it. So, and I want to, I want to make two other points, um, you know, b before we finish up that I think are, are really important. And when you say, right, like generally it's medical, educational and religion and for medical that can certainly fall under, right. These medical interventions, the children will need. Um, but that's not till puberty hits. I mean, we're talking five and six year olds and, um, you know, the, the common word, the common phrase that we'll hear is, you know, mother made a unilateral decision. Well, yeah. mom can't make a unilateral decision about anything. Mom can't make a decision about the child's gender. Um, and so her supporting the child's gender identity is not a unilateral decision. It's not in the parent agreement. Right. <laughs> it, but that is, that is where transphobia is couched under this unilateral decision and mom consult father. We don't need to consult the other parent on a child's gender. There's no consulting. Yeah. Now, if, if the child was saying, I need to, um, you know, I, I need to stop puberty, right? Like that's where it starts to get into the, um, the, the, those medical decisions that need to be made. And then the second point that I wanted to make is um, for a lot of these cases, and I don't know how familiar you are with coercive control, which is a form of intimate partner violence, um, prior to the dissolution of the relationship and, um, you know, and after there is, you know, manipulation, there is using the family courts to further abuse the parent, particularly the mother. And so we have this um, very complex system of 
intimate partner violence and institutional transphobia and interpersonal transphobia that exists. And so um, this is not just your run of the mill, oh, you know, a parent won't get on board and be supportive of their trans child, that's part of it. But the other part of it is that um, there was a history of emotional and at times physical abuse that occurred during the relationship and continues throughout, continues post dissolution of the relationship where um, the, the rejecting or abusive ex, ex partner uses the family court to further abuse the other parent. Oh. Cami, thank you so much. You are, I hope anyone who's listening to this, who is connecting with it, who's going through the same thing, reaches out to you um, because you are such a wealth of knowledge and because you're so passionate about it and really believe in these parents who are trying to affirm their kids. Um, you, you, I just hope that some of my listeners um, who are in this situation really reach out to you and tap into to your network because it's incredible. So I could go on and on and listen to you forever. Um, it makes me like want to end up into this recording and start like advocating in my state about uh, training and for guardians and judges and all of that. Um, and I just, there's just, I said it before, there's just so much work that as professionals we have to do surrounding this area. Yeah. So thank you for bringing some light to it and for all of your knowledge and the time that you spent today. Thank you so much for having me, Renee.